This audio file is a collection made of the summaries of selected articles on Harold Pinter's Dumb Vader. The recordings were made by master's degree students of English literature at Azahra University for the contemporary drama class of spring 2021. Hello everyone. Uh, the article I read for this week's play is called Eloquent Silences in Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot and Harold Pinter's The Dumb Waiter, written by Ravi Yakuchi and uh, published in AWEJ uh, for Translation and Literary Studies in 2018. I found this through their online library. The article, as the name suggests, is a study of the similarities and differences between the two plays, as well as specifically focusing on uh, the language of silence in both plays. The paper aims to show how silence speaks and conveys important messages to the audience as well, and in doing so, uses Colum Kenny's linguistics views. Uh, Kushi believes that despite the similarities between the plays, the silences in the two convey different meanings. The paper starts by explaining how silence has traditionally been treated as just absence of speech and with a, pa a passive and negative connotation. However, more modern theories explore silence as an entity of its own with profound meaning and role. Kenny's uh, 2011 book on the linguistic role of silence goes so far as to define different kinds of silence, eloquent silence being one. The article starts by highlighting uh, the two plays' similarities. Neither of the plays have linear conventional classic structures. Both um, follow two characters who await the arrival of a third character who never arrives. Uh, there is essentially no plot happening in either play, and in both plays, the characters pass the time by engaging in pointless repetitive arguments and discussions. But while Beckett's play is a prototype for absurdist plays with an unrealistic plot, Pinter's play is filled with a realistic absurdism. This can be seen in how unlike Vladimir and Estragon's wait, Ben and Gus do not wait forever. Still, the characteristics in Pinter's play are both close and inspired uh, by those in Beckett's. Then the paper goes on to talk about eloquent silence in both plays, uh, a form of silence which, according to Kenny's definition, is a pregnant silence full of uh, brooding thought and feelings that are not expressed. Both playwrights use silence to indicate a, quote, lack of communication and failure of conversation between the two characters, unquote. Silence is a sign of alienation and distance. In Pinter's play, there is the alienation with the outside world shown through the lack of windows and uh, even the dumb waiter itself. But in addition to that, there is also the lack of communication between the characters. Moreover, in Pinter's play, there is a resistance of communication as well in how Ben uh, reads the newspaper just to not talk with Gus. For Beckett, silence helps hide the character's real thoughts, but they also take an emotive function. They are used to communicate emotions such as sadness or fear. While both plays have this quality, in Waiting for Godot, uh, silence is an indication of sadness, loneliness, and nothingness. But while Pinter has borrowed the use of silence from Beckett, the silence in Dumb Vader is loaded with threats of violence. Kuchi suggests that Ben's refusal to communicate with, with Gus is in fact his attempt to hide his hostility towards his partner. And the final long silence at the end of the play is an indication that Gus's life will be coming to an end soon. Uh, overall, I really enjoyed reading this article. It was um, quite simple and short and very to the point, um, but I uh, thought that it brought up some very interesting and um, provocative ideas to mind. I had decided to read this before I 
finished reading the play so um, when I knew that I was going to read about the silences I tried to pay attention um, to the use of that in the play and I think that really helped hi um, everyone the article that I read is called the absurdity of dread in Pinterest the dumb Bader. it was written by Charles Carpenter and I found it on Google Scholar in the article, the writer is arguing that uh, literary critics who have analyzed the Dom Vader have made a big mistake. And uh, their mistake is that they have tried to find some greater existential meaning behind uh, the events that happen in the play. Um, and that they have assumed that uh, all of this uh, crazy stuff that happens in the play has some existential significance to it. Well, uh, the writer of this article argues that uh, it can be very dangerous to do such a thing, to believe that um, although things might seem um, silly or light on the surface, they should not be treated as such, and that we should try to look for greater meaning in things that don't seem to have any greater meaning. Um, actually, the writer believes that uh, this um, idea is uh, can be seen in contemporary literary criticism that uh, one must not treat light things lightly, that we should look for some existential meaning behind uh, everything that happens in the play, even um, that things that men and Gus do, although they're don't look very serious, but we should treat them seriously and we should try to find some greater meaning to it. The writer uh, believes that uh, the play cannot be uh, understood as an example of existentialism, that uh, the play is actually just a mock melodramatic farce, that even um, in the instances where we think that we can find some existential meaning in the play. The play is actually just uh, a parody of existentialism and the ideas of existentialism. For example, that um, there is a reference to uh, waiting for Godot uh, in the beginning of the play, and the writer of this article believes that it's not meant to function in a way uh, to... Mm, remind uh, the reader of that play and all the existential significances of that play, but is just a parody of uh, that um, play by Samuel Beckett. And furthermore, the writer believes that uh, the world that Ben and Gus are living in in the play is not an existential world. It is not an absurd world and uh, they do not have uh, a typical response to that absurd world because the world is just silly and crazy and unlifelike. It's a melodramatic farce, as I mentioned before. It's not an, exi an existentialist world uh, full of meaninglessness and dread. Uh, the things, uh, I mean, the world in the play is um, not like real world and it's uh, crazy and uh, there isn't any natural order to things. For example, uh, the toilet that refuses to flush uh, in the beginning of the play just happens to uh, flush by itself when um, the play requires um, some kind of an, uh, some kind of a sudden voice. So um, the world that we have in the play is a world that mm, functions uh, based on craziness and unnatural rules. And uh, the writer of this article believes that uh, Pinter isn't trying to exhibit some existential meaning uh, or he isn't even trying to portray uh, an absurd world that is an example of uh, existentialist ideas, uh, that he's just trying to create a funny, unlifelike world that's full of crazy things. And uh, the critics' uh, tendency to find some greater meaning, some greater existential significance uh, in this play has led them to completely miss uh, the funny aspects of the play and uh, the craziness of the ending. Well, personally, 
Uh, my own personal opinion is that I really enjoy finding uh, greater existential meanings behind things. And when I was reading the play for the first time, I was thinking that uh, this could be a symbol for um, meaninglessness of life. This could be a symbol for how God doesn't exist or how God has abandoned creation. I mean, I was thinking about all different kinds of things that the play could symbolize. But after reading the article, I think, um, and reading the examples that the writer mentions um, that I hope we can talk about in a class, I think that maybe it's also possible to look uh, at this play from another perspective and just um, see it as a comedy or uh, just a world that makes no sense and incidents that are supposed to make us laugh. Maybe there is no greater meaning to anything at all. Hi everyone. Um, the article that I read was titled Absurdity Underneath Realistic Elements in Painters the Dawn Waiter. It was published by Canadian Social Sciences in 2007 and it is written by P. Binion. I downloaded it from Google Scholar. Okay, the paper um, investigates how um, some elements in the play are realistic and uh, very real and um, able to be touched but underneath um, they have other meanings and they show the absurdity of many elements in the play. Um, the article starts by an introduction and then goes on and first talks about, talks about realistic elements in the play. Um, for example, the setting. Um, it says that the setting is um, very domestic, it's a basement and everything's is, everything is completely real and um, many people can feel that they've seen and um, experienced that kind of setting. And then it goes on by saying that the plot also is um, totally realistic. Um, it's complete. It, it it has a beginning, middle and ending and everything. And uh, everything is complete in the plot. And then it says that the characters in the play are realistic. Um, ben and Gus are completely realistic. They are not... Um, <clears throat> They're completely human. They are not a, uh, a static, eccentric, and inhuman like other absurdist, absurdist um, plays, for example, in Beckett and other um, absurdist, absurdist sorry, um, playwrights that um, the characters are not really human. In this play, um, these two characters are completely human and real. But the article goes on to say that um, in realistic elements in the play, we can feel the absurdity underneath all of them. Uh, for example, it talks about a universal menace outside and um, inside the room. And it talks about that um, the newspaper that Ben appears to read all the time. Um, is a kind of background of the play and um, it has a it has an important significance then it talks about the uncertainty in the play that uh, we may see some things but we don't know the reasons we see that they are happening but we don't know why and it's a kind of uncertainty that <clears throat> the writer wanted us to feel throughout um, watching the play and um, another thing Underneath the realistic elements is the alienation of the human relationship. The relationship that Gus and Ben has have um, is very alienated. They really don't talk to each other um, in a meaningful way. Um, Gus, sorry, Ben um, appears to read the newspaper, but he's always watching um, Gus and he um knows that he's gonna betray him after that so he has a kind of mixed feelings and he avoids talking about um, emotional things when they are brought up and their relationship is very alienated so all in all um, the article that i read talked about um, the realistic elements and the <clears throat> 
absurdist element in the play and how um, while we have many realistic elements such as setting, plot and characters, many um, absurdist um, elements was underneath them that when we take um, caution we can understand them. Um, I kind of agreed with it and um, it was a bit interesting for me because um, I'm not really um, very familiar and uh, professional like um, other, uh, other my classmates in drama but it was interesting for me um, to read about absurdist elements and um, the difference between reality and realistic things in a play and the things that are underneath and uh, we should by close watching or close reading understand them. Hello everyone. The article that I chose for today's class is called Rethinking Harold Pinter's Comedy of Menace. It is written by Basil Shison. It is actually one of the chapters of a book called Harold Pinter's The Dump Writer. And the editor is Mary F. Brewer. I found this book on Google Scholar. And here in this chapter, we have four parts. One part is introduction. The other is about comedy. The, excuse me. The other is about menace. The next one is about comedy. And the last one is about politics of effects. So in the first part, shi -san says that there is a common belief that earlier plays by Harold Pinter are less political because they are comedies of menace. But he disagrees and he argues against it, saying that uh, they are actually comedies of menace, but it doesn't mean that they are any less politically charged than the others. And he also explains how the term menace is not... Uh, a word coined by him, comedy of menace, excuse me, isn't coined by Pinter. It is actually used first by David Campton of, in order to describe his play, The Lunatic View. But other critics have used this term in order to uh, explain and talk, uh, explain the comedies by Harold Pinter. So Pinter himself says that menace is everywhere and he uses several dramatical devices in order to uh, manifest the menace. So one of the most famous devices used by Pinter is pause, also silence. So he uses pause in order to empower or dismantle statements and because there are used uh they are used in the middle of dialogues or in the middle of conversations uh we can actually see how the tone and how the way that a dialogue is spoken matters also we have another critic benston she says that command of language is a question of power and also we have silence here silence is used in order to show the space uh, so the plays begin with silence and we have the characters who are occupying a, a fixed scene and uh, i think it is used silence is used in order to uh, actually attract our attention to the space that they are occupying and how they are interacting with that fixed uh, scene other devices are situations such as intrusion. We all we often have characters who are trespass you know, who are trespassing. Sorry, and and they are usually aggressive. And one of the characters may ask a lot of questions, while the other character may suffer from auditory lapses. So. We also have narratives that are obscure about the past of some of the characters and they actually make us more confused because they are so vague and they may represent a kind of social breakdown. Also, shi -san compares the characters Goss and Ben to the characters uh, from Pinter's famous play birthday party those characters are goldberg and mccann but i haven't read that other place so i cannot uh, really comment on this part 
but uh, he also quotes the lose that's uh, and she says that art comes from breaking cliches so we have a lot of cliches here because this play is modeled on some scenes from gangster movies and some of those characters so we have uh we have a lot of defamiliarization here the other part is on comedy and in this part we see have irony parody and tragic comedy uh and plays and word plays about signifiers and the rule of language actually uh, makes a really learned or educated audience question the uh question the you know alienation of himself uh from the other characters from the people in the mundane world people from the everyday life so we have these two characters Gus and ben they argue about how they should use exact words uh, in order to describe a kettle that is boiling so we have uh shifts between comedy and minutes they are arguing over simple things and then they are arguing about important things and it gives rise to violence and also we have the apparatus of a dump waiter it can be a symbol of language i think this part of the article is really brilliant because that device uh it keeps giving them orders that they cannot fulfill but nevertheless they try to work with it so i think it is one of the functions of the language in the communication between humans because we may not often uh, really understand what the other person is trying to tell is trying to say but nonetheless we are trying to interact with them the last part is about politics of effect so here shisan again tries to uh clarify his point by giving a lot of examples from the other plays uh these examples include games and how uh several characters especially uh those negative characters uh confuse the audience and give uh and they actually produce complex emotional reactions in the audience in order to both uh shake the audience out of their comfort zone and in order to impact them so pinter's characters usually uh create a sense of menace by show by showing familiar conventions through contentious lens so about the last part i think uh i need to read more about pinter in order to comment on this part but uh the part on comedy and menace uh seemed really interesting to me so Hi, thank you everybody i for am listening. summarizing the dumb waiter pinter's play with the audience which is an article by thomas van lon published by university of toronto press 1981 available on project news I know that the article may be a bit old, but I think that it discusses some really good points. In this article, Van Lund criticizes a method which was often used in interpreting texts like the dumb waiter, the method of filling in. What Van Lund means by filling in is when a commentator relies on fabrication or conclusion based on guesswork instead of analyzing the actual text. For example, many commentators have written based on the premise that, quote, the play ends with the revelation that Goss is the next victim and that he is to be killed by Ben because he has begun to ask too many questions rather than, like Ben, continuing blindly to obey the orders of the organization employing them." Unquote. Van Lon finds this method of interpreting the play very questionable. The truth is that whether Ben shoots Goss or doesn't is not relevant, it's just not the point. Van Lon believes that the critics who try to interpret the play in this way do so because they are used to traditional forms of drama and therefore they just try to make a play like the dumb waiter fit their expectations of a traditional play while actually the play is far from traditional. So instead of discerning the meaning or the significance, they end up inventing the elements that they feel are missing in the play. Van Lon believes that Pinter, aware of the fact that his work is often interpreted in this way by the commentators, uses Ben and Goss to mirror his critics and so he creates a burlesque version of the audience in The Dumb Waiter. 
The evidence that Van Lon refers to for this claim is the three occasions during which Ben calls attention to an item in his newspaper. The first time, Ben reads the news about an old man dying accidentally while crawling under a truck, to which Gus responds with shock. Then similarly, Ben tells Gus about the event of an eight-year-old girl killing a cat. However, there is a crucial variation here. Because this news does not match with Ben and Gus's understanding of eight-year-old girls, they rework the data into a new event of their own making without having any actual evidence for their claim that it was actually the older brother of the girl who killed the cat. Then in the third occasion, Ben does not give any actual item from the paper, he just expresses shock, and similar to previous occasions, Gus also expresses shock. It seems like people like Ben and Gus don't need any actual data when they are responding to something, and their responses aren't even actual responses but quote, self-activated and self-gratifying perceptions relying almost exclusively on internalized stereotypes, unquote. In other words, commentators tend to respond to the work the same way that Gus responds to Ben. This satirical function, however, is not the only thing that Pinter tries to convey through these dialogues between Ben and Gus. Van Lon writes that, quote, unlike the traditional dramatist who is concerned primarily with making meaningful events, Pinter seems far more interested in ex examining the process by which meaningful events are made, unquote. What Van Lon is referring to here is basically the fact that this type of satirical representation in the play actually encourages the audience to become more self-aware and conscious toward their responses instead of just responding based on internalized stereotypes. Overall, I really like this article and I think that it, the dilemma that it discusses is relevant to this day. The only point that I'm a bit critical of is that at times it gets a bit caught up in intentional fallacy. I noticed that phrases like what Pinter means or Pinter suggests have been used a couple of times throughout the article and I personally would ha wouldn't have used those kind of phrases if I were the author. I think that the argument of the article is quite strong and valid by itself without referring to what Pinter meant, especially since I don't think that Pinter himself ever publicly talked about what he meant by the discussed passages. Except for this little bit, I found this article, article really that quite I study is called The Dumb Waiter, Realism and Metaphor by Rodmilo Nastic, which is a book chapter in a collection of articles named Harold Pinter's The Dumb Waiter, edited by Mary F. Brewer. In this article, Nastic argues that from the undoubted realism of the setting springs a metaphoric quality in the play. And the central metaphor of the play is the metaphor of the threshold. And she analyzes this metaphor, especially in the character of Gus, using the notions of departure, initiation, and return, which are defined by Joseph Campbell and Victor Turner. But before defining these terms, Nastic explains that theater has been and still is inherent in sociocultural life, and social experience is frequently the source of stage drama in which group experiences are refashioned and made meaningful. Sometimes the meaning is that there is no meaning at all, as we can see in the existential theater, for example. Then she clarifies that the link between the existential theater and Pinter's play is a discrepancy between the realistic setting and dialogue and the sudden emergence of the bizarre pictures or events that deconstruct realism. For example, we can see that there are weird orders coming down the dumb waiter, which has a puzzling effect on Goss. And before this happening, everything in the play seems to be pretty realistic, but after this event, it seems that the realism of the play is somehow deconstructed. Then she goes on to define the notions presented by Campbell and Turner, and then tries to observe them in the character of Gus. As I said earlier, Campbell and Turner present the notions called separation or departure, passage or initiation, and reunion or return. Now let's see what the definitions are. 
She says that departure begins by a crisis in life and is in essence the call to adventure. It summons the character to an awakening of self or to a decision between life or death. And if the subject refuses this adventure, he loses the power of significant action and becomes a victim who needs to be saved. Passage takes place when the subject crosses the threshold of experience, entering into temporal or spatial ambiguity with a healing or redressive effect. Return happens when the subject tries to enter a new favorable position in society, and Nastic claims that these notions that are connected to the metaphor of threshold are observable in the character of Gus. First, we can see that Gus becomes awakened and dares to ask more questions than before, especially about their job. Then he becomes disillusioned and things start to get ambiguous for him, and even the city that he lives in. And it is in this stage that Gus makes a symbolic attempt to cross the threshold by opening the door and leaving the room temporarily. Return in the character of Gus happens when he tries to distance himself from Ben, for example by not laughing at other people's stupidity or ceasing to side with Ben in different conditions. And in the end, and this um, crossing the threshold apparently makes Gus choose death instead of life because we see that he stands in front of Ben's gun without any desire to defend Hello. The article that I'm going to talk about today is Unpacking the Picturesque in the Don Waiter and Beyond, written by Mark Ishao. It was published in a book titled as Harold Pinter's The Don Waiter, edited by Michael J. Mayer and published by Penguin Publications in 2009, and it's available on Google Books. Now, this article discusses the notion of picturesque in display. The notion of picturesque actually marks Pinter's acceptance for prior to his employment in his works, they lacked the familiarity that could lead his works to be accepted in the first place. So this notion of picturesque actually served a dual purpose. It was a burden because it was so hard to employ and it was a blessing because it resulted in a very good conclusion. So this article analyzes the foundational concepts of the notion of picturesque and discovers its inherent theatrical possibilities in the dumb waiter. Now, picturesque in the dumb waiter is characterized by Pinter's atmospheric gifts, his mastery of rhythmic powerful dialogue, and his use of pauses and good timings, and his ability to make an audience accept unexplained actions, and lastly, the potential that uh, his play has in terms of destruction of an individual who contends with authority. So the components of picturesque here should work together in a nexus to unfold the Don Waiter as a theatrical piece. And notions of picturesque are exceptionally important in Pinter's work because his foundational works are mostly tragic comedies that require very high levels of artistry and rehearsal to perform well. And the presence of picturesque in the Don Waiter as one of these very renowned plays makes this play one that cannot be easily imitated, since untactful imitation of this play could strip it of its soul, which is encapsulated by the picturesque. Now, there are a lot of banal comments and tone changes in this play that signify something of a curiosity on the part of the reader, and this is exactly what Pincher wants to go for. So, the picturesque here in this play builds by way of the dialogue written uh, and the questions and the unexplainable details that remain unex unexplained throughout the play. And these notions of picturesque actually present in the work make this play an extreme critic of the authoritarian postures such as the state power, the family power, the religious power, and the power used to undermine individuals ultimately. So the presence of these elements of picturesque in the dumb waiter and the ambivalence that they cultivate in our minds as the readers add to the power and quality of Pinter's work. However, merely mimicking Pinter and his portrayal of the picturesque will not add anything to the value that picturesque actually holds. So the presence of picturesque creates tension in display, the resolving of which actually satisfies the reader. So the model that Pinter here has gone for is to create Don Waiter uh, in a way that is very in your face. And this is a technique that is also used by Sarah Kane, who was very much influenced by 
Pinter himself, and also you can see in her play Blasted, she has so much in common with Pinter's The Dawn Waiter in terms of so much unresolved menace and chaos and a lot of picturesque notions. So while I was searching for articles on display, I found out that most of the literary, literature available on display discusses the characters and their behaviors. So it was very refreshing to find an article that discussed the theatrical aspect in depth and I think the notion of picturesque actually reminds me of the notion of literariness in poetry, which is uh, introduced in Russian formalism, and how a text can flaunt itself by uh, it being uh, it having a very high quality and flaunting itself. So, in a sense, I think picturesque to play is what literariness is to poetry, and its existence actually. Uh, enriches the uh, sophistication and the intellectual qualities of the play, and Pinter has achieved this end perfectly in The Dawn Waiter. <laughs>